Welcome to the Wolf and the Crows, free lads sitting around talking about this drones. Valor Magulis, and welcome back to Fire and Blood Audiobooks with the Wolf and the Crows. This week we have for you Chapter 10. But as usual, you know what you gotta do by now, you guys. Hit that like button, share this across all your social media, and subscribe to make sure you don't miss out on any of the other chapters that we have. You can check out the playlist for the previous nine chapters and all the other content that we have, including interviews with cast and crew from Game of Thrones, filming locations, and some other videos for you to enjoy over on the YouTube channel. If you want the MP3s, check out the Patreon, and if you like what you see, hit the little join button down below to become a member of the channel and get some cool perks. So chapter 10 this week, we have Jaharis and Alasail, their triumphs and tragedies. The accomplishments of King Jaharis I Targaryen are almost too many to enumerate. Chief amongst them, in the view of most students of history, are the long periods of peace and prosperity that marked his time upon the Iron Throne. It cannot be said that Jaharis avoided conflict entirely, for that would be beyond the power of any earthly king. But such wars as he fought were short, victorious, and contested largely at sea or on distant soil. It is a poor king who wages battle against his own lords and leaves his own kingdom burned, bloody, and strewn with corpses, Septon Barth would write. His grace was a wiser man than that. Archmeisters can and do quibble about the numbers, but most agree that the population of Westeros, north of Dorne, doubled during the Consulator's reign, whilst the population of King's Landing increased fourfold. Lannisport, Gulltown, Duckinsdale and White Harbour grew as well, though not to the same extent. With fewer men marching off to war, more remained to work the land. Grain prices fell steadily throughout his reign, as more acres came under the plough. Fish became notably cheaper, even for the common men as the fishing villages along the coasts grew more prosperous and more boats put to sea. New orchards were planted everywhere from the reach to the neck. Lamb and mutton became more plentiful and wool finer as shepherds increased the size of their flocks. Trade increased tenfold despite the vicissitudes of wind, weather and wars and the disruptions they caused from time to time. The crafts flourished as well. Farriers and blacksmiths Stonemasons, carpenters, millers, tanners, weavers, felters, dyers and brewers, vintners, goldsmiths and silversmiths, bakers, butchers and cheesemakers all enjoyed a prosperity hitherto unknown west of the narrow sea. There were, to be sure, good years and bad years, but it was rightly said that under Jaharis and his queen, the good years were twice as good as the bad years were bad. Storms there were, and ill winds, and bitter winters. But when men look back today upon the Consulator's reign, it is easy to mistake it for one long green and gentle summer. Little of this would have been apparent to Jaharis himself as the bells of King's Landing rang to usher in the 55th year since Aegon's conquest. The wounds left by the cruel year that had gone before the year of the stranger, were as yet too raw. The king, queen and council alike feared what might lie ahead, with the princess Arya and Balerion still vanished from human ken, and Queen Rihanna gone in search of them. Having taken leave of her brother's court, Rihanna Targaryen flew to Old Town first, in the hopes that her wayward daughter might have sought out her twin sister. Lord Donald and the High Septum each received her courteously, but neither had any help to offer. The Queen was able to visit from a time with her daughter Rayala, so like and yet so unlike her twin, and it can be hoped that she found some balm for her pain there. When Rihanna expressed regret that she had not been a better mother, the novice Rayala embraced her and said, I have had the best mother any child could wish for, the mother above. And you are to thank for her. Departing Old Town, Dreamfire took the Queen northward, first to Highgarden, 
then to Crackhall and Casterly Rock, whose lords had welcomed her in days gone by. Nowhere had a dragon been seen, save for her own. Not even a whisper of Princess Arya had been heard. Thence Rihanna returned to Fair Isle to face Lord Franklin Farman once again. The years had not made his lordship any fonder of the Queen, nor any wiser in how to choose to speak to her. I had hoped my lady sister might come home to her duty once she fled from you, Lord Franklin said, but we have had no word of her, nor of your daughter. I cannot claim to know the princess, but I would say she is well rid of you, as was Furai. If she turns up here, we shall see her off, just as we did her mother. You did not know her, Rhea. This much is true, her grace responded. If she does indeed find her way to these shores, my lord, you may find she is not as forbearing as her mother. Oh, and I wish you luck if you should try to see off the black dread. Beleriand quite enjoyed your brother. By now he may desire another course. After Farrell, history loses track of Rihanna Targaryen. She would not return to King's Landing or Dragonstone for the rest of the year, nor present herself at the seat of any lord in the Seven Kingdoms. We have fragmentary reports of Dreamfire being seen as far north as the Barrowlands and the banks of the Fever River, and as far south as the Red Mountains of Dorne and the canyons of the Torrentine. Shunning castles and cities, Rihanna and her dragon were glimpsed flying over the fingers and the mountains of moon. The misty green forests of Cape Wrath and Shield Islands and the arbour. But nowhere did she seek out human company. Instead she sought the wide lonely places, windswept moors and grassy plains and dismal swamps, cliffs and crags and mountain glens. Was she still hunting for some sign of her daughter? Or was it simply solitude she desired? We shall never know. Her long absence from King's Landing was for the good, however, for the King and his council were growing even more vexed with her. The accounts of Rihanna's confrontation with Lord Farman on Fur Isle had appalled the King and his lords alike. Is she mad to speak so to a lord in his own hall? Lord Smallwood said. Had it been me, I would have had her tongue out to which the king replied, I hope you would not truly be so foolish, my lord. Whatever else she may be, Rihanna remains the blood of the dragon and my sister, whom I love. His grace did not take issue with Lord Smallwood's point, it should be noted, only with his words. Septum Barth said it best, The power of the Targaryens derives from their dragons, those fearsome beasts who once laid waste to Harrenhal and destroyed two kings upon the field of fire. King Jaharis knows this, just as his grandsire Aegon did. The power is always there, and with it, the threat. His grace also grasps the truth that Queen Rihanna does not. The threat is most effective when left unspoken. The lords of the realm are proud men all, and little is gained by shaming them. A wise king will always let them keep their dignity. Show them a dragon, aye, they will remember. Speak openly of burning down their halls, boast of how you fed their own kin to your dragons, and you will only inflame them and set their hearts against you. Queen Alicene prayed daily for her niece Arya and blamed herself for the child's flight, but she blamed her sister more. Jaharis, who had taken little note of Arya, even during the years she had been his heir, chitted himself now for that neglect. But it was Beleriand who most concerned him. For well he understood the dangers of a beast so powerful in the hands of an angry 13-year-old girl. Neither Rhianna Targaryen's fruitless wanderings nor the storm of ravens Grandmeister Benefer sent forth had turned up any word of the princess or, or the dragon beyond the usual lies, mistakes and delusions. As the days went by and the moon turned and turned again, the king began to fear that his niece was dead. Beleriand is a willful beast and not one to be trifled with, he told the council. To leap upon his back, never have flown before, and take him up, not to fly about the castle, no, but out across the water. Like as not, he threw her off, poor girl, 
and she lies now at the bottom of the narrow sea. Septon Barth did not concur. Dragons were not vagabond by nature, he pointed out. More often than not, they find a sheltered spot, a cave or ruined castle or mountaintop, a nest there, going forth to hunt and thence returning. Once free of his rider, Beleriand would surely have returned to his lair. It was his own surmise that, given the lack of any sightings of Beleriand in Westeros, Princess Arya had likely flown him east across the narrow sea to the vast fields of Essos. The Queen concurred. If the girl were dead, I would know it. She is still alive, I feel it. All the agents and informers that Rigo Draz had engaged to hunt down Elisa Farman and the stolen dragon eggs were now given a new mission to find Princess Arya and Beleriand. Reports soon began to come in from all up and down the narrow sea. Most proved useless, as with the dragon eggs. Rumours, lies and false sightings, concocted for the sake of a reward. Some were third or fourth hand, others with such paucity of detail that they amounted to little more than I have seen a dragon or something big with wings. The most intriguing report came from the hills of Andalos, north of Pentos, where shepherds spoke in fearful tones of a monster on the prowl, devouring entire flocks and leaving only bloody bones behind. Nor were the shepherds themselves spared, should they chance to stumble on this beast. For the creature's appetite was by no means limited to mutton. Those who actually encountered the monster did not live to describe him, however, and none of the stories mentioned fire, which Jaharis took to mean that Beleriand could not be to blame. Nonetheless, to be certain, he sent a dozen men across the narrow sea to Pentos to try to hunt down this beast, led by Sir William the Wasp of his Kingsguard. Across that self-same narrow sea, unbeknownst to King's Landing, the shipwrights of Bravos had completed work on the Carrick Sun Chaser, the dream Elisa Farman had purchased with her stolen dragon eggs. Unlike the galleys that slid forth daily from the arsenal of Bravos, she was not oared. She was a vessel meant for deep waters, not bays and covers and inland shallows. Foremasted, she carried as much sail as the swam ships of the Summer Isles, but with a broader beam and deeper hull that would allow her to store sufficient provisions for longer voyages. When one Bravosi asked her if she meant to sail the Yeti, Lady Elisa laughed and said, I may, but not by the route you think. The night before she set the sail, she was summoned to the Sea Lord's palace, where the Sea Lord served her herring, beer and caution. Go with care, my lady, he told her, but go. Men are hunting you, all up and down the narrow sea. Questions are being asked, rewards are being offered. I would not care for you to be found on Bravos. We came here to be free of old Valeria, and your Targaryens are Valerian to the bone. Sail far, sail fast. As the lady, now known as Alice Westhill, took leave of the Titan of Bravos, life in King's Landing continued as before. Unable to locate his lost niece, Jaharis Targaryen proceeded as he always would in times of trouble and gave himself over to his labours. In the quiet of the Red Keep's library, the king began work on what was to be one of the most significant of his achievements. With the able assistance of Septon Barth, Grandmaster Benefer, Lord Alban Massey and Queen Alysanne, a foursome his grace dubbed my even smaller council, Jaharis set out to codify, organise and reform all the kingdom's laws. The Westeros that Aegon the Conqueror had found had consisted of seven kingdoms in truth and not just name, each with its own laws customs and traditions. Even within those kingdoms, there had been considerable variance from place to place. As Lord Massey would write, before there were seven kingdoms, there were eight, before that nine, then ten or twelve or thirty, and back and back. We speak of the hundred kingdoms of the heroes, when there were actually ninety-seven at one time, one hundred thirty-two at another, 
and so on. The number forever changing as wars were lost and won, and sons followed fathers. Oft as not, the laws changed as well. This king was stern, this king was merciful. This one looked to the seven-pointed star for guidance. This one held the ancient laws of the first men. This one ruled by whim, the other went one way when sober and another went drunk. After thousands of years, the result was such a mass of contradictory presidents that every lord possessed of the power of pit of gallows, and some who were not, felt free to rule, however, he might wish on any case that came before his seat. Confusion and disorder were offensive to Charles to carry in, and with the help of his smaller council, he set out to clean the stables. These seven kingdoms have one single king. In his time, they had a single law as well. A task so monumental would not be one year's work or tens. Simply gathering, organising and studying the existing laws would require two years and the reforms that followed would continue for decades. Yet here is where the great cold of Septim Barth, who in the end would contribute thrice as much as any other man to the books of law that resulted, began in the autumn year of 55 AC. The king's labours would continue for many years to come, the queen's for nine turns of the moon. Early that same year, King Jaharis and the people of Westeros were thrilled to learn that Queen Alicene was once again with child. Princess Daenerys shared their delight, though she told her mother in firm terms that she wanted a little sister. You sound a queen already, laying down the law, her mother told her laughing. Marriages had long been the means by which the great houses of Westeros bound themselves together, a reliable method of forging alliances and ending disputes. Just as the conqueror's wives had before her, Alice and Targaryen delighted in making such matches. In 55 AC, she took particular pride in betrothals she arranged for two of the wise women who had served in her household since Dragonstone. Lady Janice Templeton would wed Lord Mullendor of Uplands, whilst Lady Prunella Keltegar, who was joined in marriage to Uther Peak, Lord of Starpike, Lord of Dustonbury, the Lord of Whitegrove. Both were considered exceptional matches for the ladies in question, and a triumph for the Queen. The tourney that Lord Redwine had proposed to celebrate the completion of Dragon Pit was finally held at mid-year. Lists were raised in the fields west of the city walls between the Lion Gate and the King's Gate, and the jousting there was said to be especially splendid. Lord Redwine's eldest son, Sir Robert, showed his prowess with the lance against the best the realm had to offer, whilst his brother, Rickard, won the squire's tourney and was knighted on the field by the king himself. But the champion's laurels went to the gallant and handsome Sir Simon Dondarrion, of Blackhaven, who won the love of the commons and the queen alike when he crowned Princess Daenerys as his queen of love and beauty. No dragons had been settled in the dragon pit as yet, so that colossal edifice was chosen for the site of the tourney's grand melee, a clash of arms such as King's Landing had never seen before. Seventy-seven knights took part in eleven teams. The competitors began a horse, but once unhorsed, continued on foot, battling with sword, mace, axe and morning star. When all the teams but one had been eliminated, the surviving members of the final team turned on one another until only a single champion remained. Though the participants bore only blunted tourney weapons, the battles were hard fought and bloody to the delight of the crowds. Two men were killed and more than two score wounded. Queen Alice Sane wisely forbade her favourites, John Quill Dark and Tom the Strummer, from taking part, but the old Keg o Ale once more took the field to roars of approval from the commons. When he fell, the small folk found a new favourite in the upjumped squire, Sir Harris Hogg, whose house name and pig's head helm earned him the style of Harry the Ham. Other notables who joined the melee included Sir Alan Bullock, late of Dragonstone, Rogar Baratheon's brothers, Sir Boris, 
Sir Garen and Sir Ronald, an infamous head knight called Sir Guy Le Cunning and Sir Alistair Rain, champion of the Westerlands and master at arms at Casterly Rock. After hours of blood and clangour, however, the last man left standing was a strapping young knight from the Riverlands, a broad-shouldered blonde bull called Sir Lucamore Strong. Soon after the conclusion of the tourney, Queen Alison left King's Landing for Dragonstone, there to await the birth of her child. The loss of Prince Aegon, after only three days of life, still weighed heavily upon her grace. Rather than subject herself to the rigours of travel or the demands of life at court, the Queen sought the quiet of the ancient seat of her house, where her duties would be few. Septa Edith and Septa Lyra remained by Alison's side, together with a dozen fresh young maidens, chosen from amongst a hundred, who coveted the distinction of serving as a champion to the Queen. Two of Rogar Baratheon's nieces were amongst those so honoured, along with daughters and sisters of the Lords of Arryn, Vance, Rowan, Royce and Dondarrion, and even a woman of the North, Mara Mandalay, daughter to Lord Theramore of White Harbour. To lighten her evenings, her grace also brought her favourite fool, the good wife, with his puppets. There were some at court who had misgivings about the Queen's desire to remove herself to Dragonstone. The island was damp and gloomy at the best of times, and in autumn, strong winds and storms were common. The recent tragedies had only served to blacken the castle's reputation even further, and some feared that the ghosts of Rhianna Targaryen's poisoned friends might haunt its halls. Queen Alysanne dismissed these concerns as foolishness. The king and I were so happy on Dragonstone, she told the doubters. I can think of no better place for her child to be born. Another royal progress had been planned for 55 AC, this time to the Westerlands. Just as she had when carrying Prince Daenerys, the queen refused to let the king cancel or postpone the trip and sent him forth alone. Verbathor carried him across Westeros to the Golden Tooth, where the rest of his retinue caught up with him. From there, his grace visited Ashmark, the Crag, Case, Castamere, Tarbuck Hall, Lannisport and Casterly Rock and Crack Hall. Notably, by its omission was Farad. Unlike his sister Rihanna, Jaharis Targaryen was not a man given to making threats, but he had his own ways of making his disapproval felt. The king returned from the west a moon's turn before the queen was due, so he might be by her side when she delivered. The child came precisely when the maesters had said he would, a boy, clean-limbed and healthy, with eyes as pale as lilac. His hair, when it came in, was pale as well, shining like white gold, a colour rare even in Valeria of old. Jaharis named him Aemon. Daenerys will be cross with me, Alysanne said, as she put the priceling to her breast. She was most insistent on wanting a sister. Jaharis laughed at that and said, next time. That night, at Alysanne's suggestion, he placed a dragon's egg in the prince's cradle. Thrilled by the news of Prince Eamon's birth, thousands of small folk lined the streets outside the Red Keep when Jaharis and Alysanne returned to King's Landing a month's turn later in hopes of getting a glimpse of their new heir to the Iron Throne. Hearing their chants and cheers, the king finally mounted the ramparts of the castle's main gate and raised the boy over his head for all to see. Then, it was said, a roar went up so loud it could be heard across the narrow sea. As the Seven Kingdoms celebrated, word reached the king that his sister Rihanna had been seen again, this time at Greenstone, the ancient seat of House Estermont on the Isle of the same name, off the shores of Cape Wrath. Here, she decided to linger for a time. The very first of Rihanna's favourites, her cousin, Larissa Valeron, had been married to the second son of the even star of Tarth, it may be recalled. Though her husband was dead, Lady Larissa had borne him a daughter, who had only recently been wed to the elderly Lord Estermont. Rather than remain on Tarth or return to Driftmark, the widow had chosen to stay with her daughter on Greenstone after the wedding. 
that Lady Larissa's presence drew Rihanna Targaryen to Estermont cannot be doubted, for the island was elsewise singularly lacking in charm, being damp, windswept and poor. With her daughter lost to her, and her dearest friends and favourites in the grave, it should not be surprising that Rihanna sought solace with the companion of her childhood. It would have surprised and enraged the Queen to know that another former favourite was passing close to her at that very moment. After stopping at Pentos to take on supplies, Alice Westhill and her son Chaser had made their way to Tyrosh, with only the narrowest part of the narrow sea betwixt them and Estermont. The perilous passage through the parrot infested waters of the Stepstones lay ahead, and Lady Ellis was hiring crossbowmen and sail swords to see her safely through the straits to open water, as many prudent captain did. The gods and their caprice chose to keep Queen Rihanna and her betrayer ignorant of one another, however, and the sun chaser passed through the stepstones without incident. Ellis Westhill discharged her hirelings on lice, taking on fresh water and provisions before turning west and setting sail for Old Town. Winter came to Westeros in 56 AC, and with it, grim news out of Essos. The men that King Jaharis had sent to investigate the great beast prowling the hills north of Pentos were all dead. Their commander, Sir William the Wasp, had engaged a guide in Pentos, a local who claimed to know where the monster lurked. Instead, he had led them into a trap, and somewhere in the velvet hills of Andalos, Sir William and his men had been set upon by, by brigands. Though they had given a good account of themselves, the numbers were against them, and in the end, they were overwhelmed and slain. Sir William had been the last to fall, it was said. His head had been returned to one of the Lord Rigo's agents in Pentos. There is no monster, Setham Barth concluded after hearing the sad tale. Only men stealing sheep and telling tales to frightened other men away. Miles Smallwood, the king's hand, urged the king to punish Pentos for the outrage. But Jaharis was unwilling to make war upon an entire city for the crimes of some outlaws. So the matter was put to rest and the fate of Sir William the Wasp was inscribed in the white book of the king's guard. To fill his place, Jaharis awarded a white cloak to Sir Luckamore Strong, the victor of the great melee in the dragon pit. More news soon came from Lord Rigo's agents across the water. One report spoke of a dragon being displayed in the fighting pits of Astapor on Slaver's Bay. A savage beast with shorn wings, the slavers set against bulls, cave bears and packs of human slaves armed with spears and axes, whilst thousands roared and shouted. Set them Barth dismissed the account at once. A wyvern beyond the doubt, he declared. The wyverns of Sutheros are oft taken for dragons by men who have never seen a dragon. Of far more interest to the king and council was the great fire that had swept across the disputed lands a fortnight past. Fanned by strong winds and fed by dry grasses, the blaze had raged for three days and three nights, engulfing half a dozen villages and one free company, the adventurers, who found themselves trapped between the onrushing flames and a Tyroshi host under the command of the Archon himself. Most had chosen to die upon Tyroshi's spears rather than be burned alive. Not a man of them had survived. The source of the fire remained a mystery. A dragon, Sir Miles Smorewood declared. What else could it be? Rigo Draz remained unconvinced. A lightning strike, he suggested. A cook fire. A drunk with a torch looking for a whore. The king agreed. If this were Balerion's doing, he would surely have been seen. The fires of Essos were far from the mind of the woman calling herself Alice Westhill in Old Town. Her eyes were fixed upon the other horizon, on the storm-lashed western seas. Her sun chaser had come to port in the last days of autumn, yet still she lingered at dockside as Lady Alice searched for a crew to sail her. She was proposing to do what only a handful of the boldest marinas had ever dared attempt before, to sail beyond the sunset in search of lands undreamed of, and she did not want men aboard who might lose heart, rise up against her, 
or force her to turn back. She required men who shared her dream, and such were not easily found, even in Old Town. Then as now, ignorant small folk and superstitious sailors clung to the belief that the world was flat and ended somewhere far to the west. Some spoke of walls of fire and boiling seas, some of black fogs that went on forever, some of the very gates of hell. Wiser men knew better. The sun and moon were spheres, as many with eyes could see. Reason suggested that the world must be a sphere as well, and centuries of study had convinced the archmeisters of the conclave there would be no doubt of that. The dragon lords of the freehold of Valeria had believed the same, as did the wives of many distant lands, from Carth to Yeti and the Isle of Ling. The same accord did not exist as regards the size of the world. Even amongst the archmeisters of the citadel, there was deep division on that question. Some believed the Sunset Sea to be so vast that no man could hope to cross it. Others argued it might be no wider than the Summer Sea, where it stretched from the arbour to Great Morak. A tremendous distance, to be sure, but one that a bold captain might hope to navigate with the right ship. A western route to the silks and spices of Yeti and Lang could mean incalculable riches for the man who found it. If the sphere of the world was as small as these wise men suggested. Alice Westhill did not believe it was. The scant writings she left behind show that even as a child, Elisa Farman was convinced the world was far larger and far stranger than the Meisters imagined. Not for her merchant's dream of reaching Othos and Ashai by sailing west. Hers was a bolder vision. Between Westeros and the far eastern shores of Essos and Othos, she believed lay other lands and other seas waiting to be discovered. Another Essos, another Sothoros, another Westeros. Her dreams were full of sundering rivers and windswept plains, towering mountains and their shoulders in the clouds, of green islands verdant in the sun, of strange beasts no man had tamed and queer fruits no man had tasted, of golden cities shining underneath strange stars. She was not the first to dream this dream. Thousands of years before the conquest, when the kings of winter still reigned in the north, Brandon the shipwright had built an entire fleet of ships to cross the Sunset Sea. He took them west himself, never to return. His son and heir, another Brandon, burned the yards where they were built and was known as Brandon the Burner forevermore. A thousand years later, iron men sailing out from Great Wyke were blown off course onto a cluster of rocky islands eight days sail to the northwest of any known shore. Their captain built a tower and a beacon there, took the name of Farwind and called his seat the Lonely Light. His descendants lived there still, clinging to rocks where seals outnumbered men fifty to one. Even the other iron men considered the Farwinds mad. Some named them Selkies. Brandon the shipwright and the ironborn who came after him had both sailed the northern seas where monstrous krakens, sea dragons and leviathans the size of islands swam through cold grey waters and the freezing mists had floating islands made of ice. Alice Westhill did not intend to voyage in their wake. She would sail her sun chaser on a more southerly course, seeking warm blue waters and the steady wind she believed would carry her across the Sunset Sea. But first, she had to have a crew. Some men laughed at her, while others called her mad, or cursed her to her face. Strange beasts, aye, one rival captain told her, and like as not, you'll end up in the belly of one. A good portion of the gold that the Sea Lord had paid for her stolen dragon's eggs reposed safely in the vaults of the Iron Bank of Bravos, however, and with such wealth behind her, Lady Alice was able to tempt sailors by paying thrice the wages other captains would offer. Slowly, she began to gather willing hands. Inevitably, word of her efforts came to the attention of the Lord of Hightower. Lord Dornell's grandsons, Eustace and Norman, 
Both noted mariners in their own right were sent to question her and clap her in fetters if they felt it prudent. Instead, both men signed on with her, pledging their own ships and crews to her mission. After that, sailors clambered over one another in their haste to join her crew. If the high towers were going, there were fortunes to be had. The Sun Chaser departed Old Town on the 23rd day of the third moon of 56 AC, making her way down Whispering Sound for the open seas in the company of Sir Norman Hightower's Autumn Moon and Sir Eustace Hightower's Lady Meredith. Their departure came not a day too soon, for word of Alice Westhill and her departure and her desperate search for her crew had finally reached King's Landing. King Jaharis saw through Lady Elise's false name at once and immediately sent ravens to Lord Donald in Old Town, commanding him to take this woman into custody and deliver her to the Red Keep for questioning. The birds came too late, however, or perhaps, as some suggest, even to this day, Donald the Delair delayed again. Unwilling to risk the king's wrath, his lordship dispatched a dozen of his own swiftest ships to chase down Alice Westall and his grandsons. But one by one, they straggled back to the report. Defeated. Seas are vast, and ships small, and none of Lord Donald's vessels could match the sun chaser for speed when the wind was in her sails. When word of her escape reached the Red Keep, the king pondered long and hard on chasing after Elisa Farman himself. No ship can sail as swiftly as a dragon flies, he reasoned. Mayhaps Vermithor could find her where Lord Hartar's ships could not. The very notion terrified Queen Elisane, however. Even dragons cannot stay aloft forever, she pointed out, and such charts as existed for the Sunset Sea showed neither islands nor rocks to rest upon. Grandmaster Benefer and Septon Barth concurred, and against their opposition, his grace reluctantly put the idea aside. The 13th day of the fourth moon of 56 AC dawned cold and grey, with a blustery wind blowing from the east. Court records tell us that Jaharis I Targaryen broke his fast with an envoy of the Iron Bank of Bravos, who had come to collect the annual payment of the Crown's loan. It was a contentious meeting. Elisa Farman was still very much in the King's thoughts, and he had certain knowledge that her sun chaser had been built in Bravos. His Grace demanded to know if the Iron Bank had financed the building of the ship, and whether they had any knowledge of the stolen dragon eggs. The banker for his part, denied all. Elsewhere in the Red Keep, Queen Alice spent the morning with her children. Princess Daenerys had finally warmed to her brother, Aemon, though she still wanted a little sister. Septon Barth was in the library, Grandmaster Benefer in his rookery. Across the city, Lord Corbury was inspecting the men of his east barracks of the city watch, whilst Rigo Draz entertained a young lady of negotiable virtue in his manse below the dragon pit. All of them would long remember what they were doing when they heard the blast of a horn ringing through the morning air. The sound of it ran down my spine like a cold knife, the Queen would say later, though I could not have said why. In a lonely watchtower overlooking the waters of Blackwater Bay, a guard had glimpsed dark wings in the distance and sounded the alarum. He sounded the horn again as the wings grew larger, and a third when he saw the dragon plane, black against the clouds. Beleriand had returned to King's Landing. It had been long years since the Black Dread had last been seen in the skies above the city, and the sight filled many a Kingslander with dread, wondering if somehow Magor the Cruel had returned from beyond the grave to mount him once again. Alas, the rider clinging to his neck was not a dead king, but a dying child. Beleriand's shadow swept across the yards and halls of the Red Keep as he came down, his huge wings buffeting the air to land in the inner ward by Magor's Worldfast. Scarcely had he touched the ground than Princess Arya slid from his back. Even those who had known her best during her years at court scarce recognised the girl. She was near enough to naked 
as to make no matter. Her clothing no more rags and tatters clinging to her arms and legs. Her hair was tangled and matted, her limbs as thin as sticks. Please, she cried to the knights and squires and serving men who had seen her descend. Then, as they came rushing toward her, she said, I never, and collapsed. Sir Lucamore Strong had been at his post on the bridge across the dry moat surrounding Magor's Holdfast. Shoving aside the other onlookers, he lifted the princess in his arms and carried her across the castle to Grandmeister Benefer. Later, he would tell anyone who would listen that the girl was flushed and burning with fever, her skin so hot he could feel it even through the enameled scale of his armour. She had blood in her eyes as well, the knight claimed, and there was something inside her, something moving that made her shudder and twist in his arms. He did not tell these tales for long though. The next day, King Jaharis sent for him and commanded him to speak no more of the princess. The king and the queen were sent for at once, but when they reached the Meister's chambers, Benefer denied them entry. You do not want to see her like this, he told them, and I would be remiss if I allowed you any closer. Guards were posted at the door to keep servants away as well. Only Septon Barth was admitted to administer the rites for the dying. Benefer did what he could for the stricken princess, giving her milk of the poppy and immersing her in a tub of ice to bring her fever down. But his efforts were to no avail. Whilst hundreds crowded in the red keep sipped to pray for her, Jaharis and Alassane kept vigil outside the Meister's door. The sun had set and the hour of the bat was at hand when Barth emerged to announce that Arya Targaryen was dead. The princess was consigned to the flames the very next day at sunrise, her body wrapped in fine white linen from head to toe. Grandmaster Benefer, who had prepared for her for the funeral pyre, looked half dead himself, Lord Redwine confided to his sons. The king announced that his niece had died of a fever and asked the realm to pray for her. King's Landing mourned for a few days before life resumed as before. And that was the end of it. Mysteries remained, however. Even now, centuries later, we are no closer to knowing the truth. More than 40 men had served the Iron Throne as Grand Meister. Their journals, letters, account books, memoirs and court calendars are a single best record of the events they witnessed. But not all of them were equally diligent. Whereas some left as volumes of letters full of empty words, never failing to note what the king ate for supper and whether he enjoyed it, others set down no more than a half dozen missives a year. In this regard, Benefer ranks near the top, and his letters and journals provide us with detailed accounts of all that he saw, did, and witnessed whilst in the service of King Jaharis and his uncle Magor before him. And yet, in all of Benefer's writings, there is not a single word to be found concerning the return of Arya Targaryen and her stolen dragon to King's Landing, nor the death of the young princess. Fortunately, Septon Barth was not so reticent, and it is to his own account we must now turn. Barth wrote, It has been three days since the princess perished, and I have not slept. I do not know that I shall ever sleep again. The mother is merciful. I have always believed, and the Father above judges each man justly. But there was no mercy and no justice in what befell our poor princess. How could the gods be so blind or so incurring as to permit such horror? Or is it possible that there are other deities in this universe, such as the monstrous evil gods, as the priests of Red Rahaller preach against, against whose malice the kings of men and the gods of men are naught but flies. I do not know. I do not want to know. If this makes me a faithless septum, so be it. Grandmeister Benefer and I have agreed to tell no one of all of what we saw and experienced in his chamber. And that poor child lay dying. Not the king, nor the queen, nor her mother, 
not even the archmeisters of the citadel, but the memories will not leave me, so I shall set them down here. Mayhaps by the time they are found and read, men will have gained a better understanding of such evils. We have told the world that Princess Area died of a fever, and that is broadly true, but it was a fever such as I have never before and never hoped to see again. The girl was burning. Her skin was flushed and red, and when I laid my hand upon her brow to learn how hot she was, it was as if I had thrust it into a pot of boiling oil. There was scarce an ounce of flesh upon her bones. So gaunt and starved did she appear, but we could observe certain swellings inside her as her skin bulged out and then sunk down again, as if, no, not, not as if, for this was the truth of it. There were things inside her, living things, moving and twisting, mayhaps searching for her way out, and giving her such pain that even the milk of the poppy gave her no surcrease. We told the king, as we must surely tell her mother, that Arya never spoke, but that is a lie. I pray that I shall soon forget some of the things she whispered through her cracked and bleeding lips. I cannot forget how oft she begged for death. All the Meister's arts were powerless against her fever, if indeed we can cause such a horror by such a commonplace name. The simplest way to say it is that the poor child was cooking from within. Her flesh grew darker and darker and then began to crack until her skin resembled nothing so much. Seven saved me as pork cracklings. Thin tendrils of smoke issued from her mouth, her nose, even, most obscenely, from her nether lips. By then, she had ceased to speak, though the things within her continued to move. Her very eyes cooked within her skull and finally burst like two eggs left in a pot of boiling water for too long. I thought that was the most hideous thing that I could ever see, but I was quickly disabused of the notion, for a worse horror was awaiting me. That came when Benifer and I lured the poor child into a tub and covered her with ice. The shock of that immersion stopped her heart at once, I tell myself. If so, that was a mercy. For that was when the things inside her came out. The things, mother have mercy, I do not know how to speak of them. They were worms with faces, snakes with hands, twisting, slimy, unspeakable things that seemed to writhe and pulse and squirm as they came bursting from her flesh. They were no bigger than my little finger, but one at least was as long as my arm. Oh. Warrior, protect me. The sound they made. They died, though I must remember that, cling to that. Whatever they might have been, they were creatures of heat and fire, and they did not love the ice, oh no. One after another, they thrashed and writhed and died before my eyes, thank the seven. I will not presume to give them names. They were horrors. The first part of Septon Barth's accounts ends there, but some days later he returned and resumed. To be continued.